Okay, welcome to part nine of the machine learning with R uh, series. This is Ryan Womack, data librarian at Rutgers University Libraries, and this will be the final segment of this series. This part, we're talking about neural networks. So neural networks um, are a method uh, of filtering data through various nodes um, that are in an idealized world thought to be similar to neurons uh, and allowing models to iterate and converge over weightings across those nodes until a final best fit model emerges. Um, these models have a kind of black box quality to them. Um, however, they can be very effective uh, for certain tasks, uh, things like image classification and others. Uh, so it's um, a worthy tool. Now in R, there's a package called NNet. That is the classic R package for neural networks. Um, there's another package called NeuralNet, which, although the description seems promising, it has not been updated since 2019. And um, that makes me uncertain of its status, although I don't have any direct information about that. Uh, NNet is is fairly simple. It does not capture a lot of the complexity that's possible with neural nets, uh, but we're going to start there as a sort of standard, basic, classic version. Uh, and then I'm going to show you something else, which is H2O. So H2O is a multiple purpose machine learning ma engine. It does a lot of other things actually, but we're going to look at it for neural nets. Um, so when we're working with neural networks, this is another machine learning um, method that requires normalized data. We've already done that in our previous segments, so um, that's uh, that's fine. And the neural net uses uh, a generic approach with a number of layers, right? So the the data original data starts. Um, and then it passes through a number of layers with a, number, a certain number of nodes per layer. And this is something that you can tune. Um, that This allows the, the data to be fit to a wider range of situations. But as I said, it's kind of a black box. It's very hard to interpret what those weights on the intermediate uh, stages mean. Often we just let the computer store the, those weights and ask the computer, hey, what do you predict for um, data that looks like this? Uh, this is also a method that is uh, computationally intensive, so we have to be careful to limit our um, our inputs, be, be parsimonious in how we do that. Uh, so I'm just going to start with a, a simple classic example using the IRIS data set once again. Uh, we are Splitting it into training and test, as we have done before. Uh, creating an X and a Y. Uh, here again, we're trying to predict species. And just as we did before, except we used a different method, uh, you'll see this code looks just the same. right? We're, we're using uh, caret to handle these details, but we're applying the NNet model, um, which has two parameters, size and decay. and we're just going to let the model run to 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 do that. So we can see that it actually loops through several iterations and it, until it converges on values, it repeats that a few times, um, and then is going to give us a kind of average result. So the fitted data we can take a look at is something that looks like like this. This data has already been sorted um, to not be very random, uh, so that's why our fitted data is all lined up like that. When we look at the model, um, we can see there were 75 samples, uh, four predictors, three classes, and we were able to achieve a maximum of 99.7% uh, 
accuracy with final values of sorry actually the, so the 99.7 percent accuracy was achieved at size three and in increasing that size to a size of five didn't improve it right so we we stick with size three decay equals 0.1 as our tuning parameters um, we can plot that and showing the change in accuracy for the different number of hidden units, hidden, hidden nodes, hidden units. And we can check our predictive power. Kappa is the terminology used here for the predictive value. Predictive a kappa of 1 means it will predict things perfectly. So this predicts at a 99.5% um, accuracy. The ac so accuracy is really fitting the existing data and kappa is its predictive performance. Um, here in this model they're very similar but those could differ depending on the kinds of data. And so we are um, generating that predicted data and we can once again generate a confusion matrix which will tell us uh, in this case, there's just one cell really that has things misclassified. Uh, Versicolor had a little trouble with um, things that were actually Versicolor. Four of them got labeled as Virginia, Virginica, excuse me. Otherwise, the classification of Setosa was perfect. The identification of Virginica was perfect. Uh, all the Virginica were correctly identified, plus some of these false positives for Virginica. So that's another uh, use of the confusion matrix. Um, so this is a you know as we see the the nnet method uh, is it's nice it's it's simple it's straightforward but it doesn't um, let us do much else with with the tuning of the neural net. So uh, this again is not an area I'm not a super expert in this I'm trying to expose you to some tools that are out there with the hope that you may delve in and go further. But one of the things that I found uh, when investigating this was H2O. Uh, so H2O is a uh, a non, it's not R only, it's not an R package. Uh, it is um, its own uh, software tool and it covers multiple machine learning approaches. <coughs> it is parallelizable so we can make use of multiple cores to, for our computations. This makes it a good choice for things like working on a high-performance computing cluster. Um, we would launch it with this H2O init, um, but this requires us to be to have a number of other things installed. So, <coughs> excuse me. What I'm going to do is um, is talk a little bit about that installation process and the connecting it to your R Studio is a little bit of a different animal. Uh, the H2O project itself is at h2o.ai. Um, as you can see, making world-class AI models and apps. And if you go to open source, you can get access to the platform itself. So this download latest. Um, you can download H2O. It's just a zip file. It's a zip file that um, runs this Java installer. Um, so you can download, run these scripts, and unzip it. And then you'll have on your local browser. Uh, it opens up a port that allows you to start to do work in the browser like this. So we um, we can import files, we can um, build models, we have various uh, navigation menus that allow us to pick specific models and if we go to 
say deep learning we can select algorithms we have all these parameters uh, and this is an example of you know something where we can we can get into much more fine-grained tuning as you can see it's quite complex um, in its presentation um, so this is is sort of the next stage that you may want to think about for um, fitting fitting models now it has a kind of a Jupyter notebook uh, approach where we can enter code in cells right so we can add a cell And this assist command is just a help command. So I'm typing that in. And then when I go to run the cell, which I can run with the control enter abbreviation, it's going to provide the assistance to me. So I need to bring data in to this environment, which I can do using the import files. And then I can start to work with it uh, in in this setup, uh, and we can we can tap into this from our um, with this H two O init, and there are certain H two O commands that we can access as well. Um, so this data is. Um, H2O is not, again, designed for R, uh, but this package uh, for H2O within R connects us to it, right? So we can um, work with our data. The problem is that H2O does not read R files directly, so we have to kind of dump the, um, the R files into CSV format. And I just want to see where my working directory is. I'm going to modify this path to be something a bit simpler. This obviously would be whatever path you have that you could save your uh, test and training data to. And let's try this out. So I'm going to write the CSV file for the training data. I'm going to write the CSV file for the test data. Um, and then I'm going to ask H2O to upload the file. Um, and this warning message, um, I think, uh, is not going to get in the way of this functioning for right now. Um, I might need, need a... I tried to uh, reinstall, but it might need a complete reboot before it'll recognize that, which I don't want to do given all of the uh, data that I've got loaded in right now. Okay, so you can see that this H2O upload file uh, has imported those, those data items, uh, and now we can invoke H2O. So we can invoke the deep, deep learning unit and we have access to you know, additional parameters here. We have a training frame, we have a validation frame. So that's really training and test, right? That's a little bit different terminology, calling it the validation frame. Um, and we can, can specify some additional tuning parameters here, right? So if we look at the help for deep learning we can see that um, X and Y are, are index vectors. So in our original data, we're um, predicting based on columns one through four, and our response variable is column six, that's Y. And you can see that 
we could all of those things that we just we saw in the graphical menu uh, on H2O um, are things that we can specify via text commands as well. So once again, this is just not an area that I have any experience in any or any advice to give you about um, how to set this up. But H2O is a, a leading way to deal with, with these issues and obviously gives you a lot of options to set those. So if I start to build my data here, you can see that this uh, neural network, again, is, is computationally intensive. Even though we have our small training data, it still takes a little while to, to iterate and run that, that model. Um, let's look at the variable names that that model has produced. No, that's not. Uh, so this is a sort of unhappy result here. We, um, we, the model ran, but it looks like it, it failed to generate anything useful. And I don't know, maybe this is now my lack of an update is coming back to uh, catch me. Um, my model is not defined. Let's just look at my model. All right, so let me change the code here, and this will be present in your updated version as soon as I submit these changes. My approach to try to find the names did not work for H2O, but the model did run. Uh, you can see when we just type my model, we get this output describing what happened. Uh, we have these four layers um, and then various parameters that discuss um, how those are weighted. Um, and this is where, again, I don't find these uh, parameters to be something you can interpret directly. You know, it's very interactive. Um, with the other nodes and it's just not something you can just look at and make a, a judgment on it. However, we can see that we, um, we, we can compare different models by comparing their RMSE stats as we usually do. So on the training frame, uh, we had an RMSE of 0.97. When we validated the, the data that bumped up a bit to 1.0, but not too much of a change. Um, and if we had alternative models, uh, we, we could compare on the basis of RMSE, which one is better. Um, if we want to unpack this data back into R, uh, it requires a little bit of wiggling around, right? So if I want to um, take get the predicted values, uh, I can use this H2O predict function on the basis of the test data. Um, then I convert it to a data frame because it doesn't come in as a data frame. Um, I'll take the test data itself as a data frame. And now I can plot those two things against each other um, so I can see how, how my predictions are performing. And that may take a moment to generate. Here we go. All right, so I have um, predicted values. So once again, I have this. This is this is the the categorical data that we had just been working with. You could experiment by going back a step and using the non-categorical data. But here we have the data that is either um, at the curb with a measurement of zero uh, or the data that has some distance from the curb. That's our, our sixth variable, remember, feet from the curb. So we can see that the prediction um, doesn't really, I mean, we from this level, we can't really tell much of a pattern, right? We, we, we could see a strong pattern if there were, um, like say, low uh, predicted 
values associated with the left hand option of close to the curb and high predicted values associated with the right hand option um, and that might indicate a way to get a better fit or a better prediction here there's a lot of overlap um, but that's you know uh, 400,000 points all overlapping on this categorical graph so it's not really super interpretable um, so as I mentioned I'm not like an H2O expert I'm not a neural net expert um, but I want to point you in that direction if this kind of thing interests you uh, here are a couple of links in the code that talk about um, how to work with H2O in combination with R and how to work with H2O for large data sets because I, you know I think this is um, like a number of projects very promising uh, certainly not the only way to get this kind of work done um, without even getting into you know Python for machine learning um, but it's it's one method that will handle neural nets um, via the deep learning options and as we can see there there are a number of other models uh, that you could also use this tool for if that's your thing um, also just an example of um, for the newer tools you know you you have this process of adaptation where R begins to latch on and start to make use of them over time functions develop that make it much more seamless to pass data back and forth and make use of those other tools uh, until you get something like the carrot implementation of this might um, make it almost a one-step process uh, without additional installs and it's it's how R tends to evolve over time so this has been a, a longer session, partly because of the data, partly because of the number of things that we've been looking at. I want to thank you for your attention. If you've made it this far, that's fantastic. Um, I hope that you continue to learn about data, learn about machine learning, learn about R, and uh, just keep improving your skills. So thanks again, and wish you success.